What is up, basketball fans? Welcome to the NBA Outlet, presented by Off the Glass. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, as always, Corey Waldron. And special guest today, Brendan Smart. What is up, fellas? How are we doing? Uh, doing good. How are you, Nick? Brendan, happy to have you on the show. And uh, a lot of stuff happened this week. <laughs> yeah, it really oh, has. Yeah. The NBA doesn't really stop. <laughs> yeah, it's the best, best sport in the world. Always drama. Always drama. Always news. It's always flowing. Best sport, best reality show, whatever you want to call it. We got plenty of news to talk about. Before we get started, though, quick reminder check out the outlet on iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Google Play, Dash Radio, and YouTube. But I guess we'll start off with the coach firing. Fred Hoiberg was fired after a 5 and 19 start. You know, career record was 115 and 155, which is actually a little bit higher than I expected. But uh, what were your thoughts on Hoiberg being fired? And uh, not to mention, you know, uh, President of Basketball Operations, John Paxson, said it wasn't as much about the record, but more about the energy and the spirit around the team. Well, uh, Frank Larkin, or I'm sorry, not Frank, Lori Larkin, Larkin uh, talked about uh, the firing of Hoiberg, but it was in a passive way, kind of like uh, the way Hoiberg handled his coaching. Uh, Hoiberg was more of a passive coach in terms of uh, labeling duties and labeling jobs for certain players. So Marketing handled, uh, when, when asked questions about Hoiberg's, wh when he lost the locker room, uh, Marketing kind of pushed it off as, you know, we played hard, that type of thing. Um, Marketing defined what Hoiberg was as a, the Chicago Bulls coach. Uh, he didn't really answer the question, just kind of like uh, Hoiberg didn't really live up to the expectation of the job. Um, Levine had some really nice words on Hoiberg in terms of Lewin always plays hard. So he loved Hoiberg and, you know, he loved that Le Hoiberg gave Levine a lot of leash to go out there and play. And, you know, overall, I mean, Hoiberg didn't really live up to the hype. And I also want to say that I don't think the Bulls really put the pieces around him throughout those four seasons because um, each year got worse. And, and just like each year got worse, the talent on his roster got worse. It, it just really never worked out with Fred Hoiberg. Uh, obviously those first couple of years, um, he had – well, that one year he had Jimmy Butler and Dwayne Wade and uh, Rajon Rondo, and they went completely against what the league was doing and shooting threes, which is not the type of Fred uh, – the type of offense that Fred Hoiberg likes to run, which is a lot of shooting and spacing the floor. Um, and then, you know, like you said, those marketing quotes were – I mean, read into them, read in between the lines of what he was saying. Um, it just it just didn't work. His team played no defense. They never showed any signs of playing defense. Uh, him not having control is the most accurate way to put this. Yeah, you guys are pretty spot on. It was from both parties. You know, Fred Hoiberg wasn't aggressive enough. Like Brennan was saying, you know, that marketing interview was kind of really telling where he they asked him was like, did he have control of the locker room? And he's like, oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> it's really not a hard question. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, yes or no type of thing. And you could kind of tell. And also there's been plenty of reports. And then also, like you said, Brendan, too, and Corey, the roster around him wasn't the fit that he wanted. He never got to play the offense that he wanted to play. And then obviously that hurt him and probably hurt his confidence as an NBA head coach to start off with the team he did. It was, uh, the, I think the first season was still like Derrick Rose and a lot of the old Bulls. And they were running with, you know, players that Tibbs used. And that was obviously the opposite of what he wanted. So it really didn't work out well. And the touch on the loss of the locker room thing, Antonio Blakeney, uh, a player on the Bulls team, was subbed out at one point, And he said to Hoiberg on the bench, this is a report, why the fuck are you taking me out? So if a player wow. is saying that to a coach, you know, you know there are some major issues. He doesn't have much control, and he was out of the rotation later on. But at that point, for a player to say it to the coach is unacceptable, and you kind of know the locker room is lost there. Uh, of course. And, and and add on to what why Horberg was fired. I mean, you can go back to the Jimmy Butler and uh, Dwayne Wade days and Rajon Rondo of, of how he handled managing a game throughout. He never really was consistent in, like, having a, a, a five that could go up against, against the other five, you know. He could never really uh, play chess with the other coach, and that, that was one of his biggest flaws from day one. Yeah, it definitely is. It was just a really weird situation. Uh, now, Jim Boylan's taken over as the new head coach, and he wasn't labeled as an interim head coach. He was actually labeled as the head coach. What are your thoughts on him, and do you think he can bring anything to this team? Uh for for the purpose of the future of the Bulls, I think it's always good that your future or your current cornerstone player likes him. Levine loves him, and he's also letting his teammates know it. He 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 labeled Boylan as a uh, a gritty coach, 
uh, a hard coach, a, a guy that's hard to play for in terms of he wants the most out of you every night. And Levine likes that. He says he's had a few of those. And he's also making sure that his teammates know that, you know, not every player is ready for those coaches that are going to push you to the max every single night and be in your face and yelling at you. And, and Boylan's that, and Levine likes that. So I think if Levine likes that at the end of the day, that's that's your best player right now, other than marketing and your highest paid player. So if Levine likes it, I think the Bulls will be okay. Yeah, I mean, you, we'll have to see how this team, you know, do they get underneath his, underneath him? Do they support their coach? Or do we have the same annex that we just heard of, you know, telling Hoiberg, I didn't hear that before you said that, Nick, that he told the coach that <laughs> why the hell he's telling me out. Like, um, it's not something you expect to hear. <laughs> as, long as, as long as that stops now and that doesn't continue going farther, then it'll be better than it was. I mean, obviously, this team's got some young talent. I really like Laurie Markkinen, uh, watching him last night against the Pacers. I mean, he's he's going to be extremely good. And him, Wendell Carter Jr., uh, that's an interesting pairing down low. Uh, and then it really just depends on how Parker and Levine, do they want to play any defense? I mean, this team can score. It's whether or not they want to play defense or if they can start to play any type of defense. And maybe, you know, whatever coach can finally get the team to play defense, that's when they'll be successful. And I know, Corey, you probably watched the Pacer game last night. You could kind of hear Boylan on the sidelines, you know, yelling out to his players. Sure. Yelling out to different, yeah. Yeah. Very chirpy, kind of reminds you of Tibbs a little bit. I think there was a quote before the game. It said he was so excited that he wished that he could have suited up and played with the guys out in the court. So he definitely seems like a guy that's very intense, and hopefully that'll help the team kind of play defense. What do you guys expect from the Bulls the rest of the year? Is it going to be, you know, a tanking season, or are they going to try to be a little bit more competitive? Because like uh, Paxson said, it wasn't about the record. It was more about the energy and the spirit of the team, quote-unquote. I, I think that you'll see – what Memphis did last year when they fired Fizdale. Uh, although Bigger Staff was an interim head coach until this offseason, Boylan actually has the job right now. So I don't know what the deal is with that. But I think they will tank. I think they need another draft pick. I don't think they'll be too public about tanking. But, like, in terms of not putting the guys out there, uh, like last year Memphis took great Tyreek. I, I think they'll rest Levine and uh, Markin in on some nights. Um, and, and you'll see that type of thing. But overall, from the time Hoiberg was fired, I think the Bulls need to grow internally in terms of growing underneath Boylan if they want to go with him for the next five to six years or however long. But they, they have to be all in on a coach, and they have to be all in on a like a style of play because we don't know what their style of play is because Hoiberg was fully against going against the league with two-point shots and stuff like that. So what's your plan for Boylan and what's your team, what's your plan for the rest of the roster is my, my question moving forward. And hopefully we'll hear more of that as the season moves on. What about you, Corey? What do you think is going to be the, you know, the outlook for the Bulls moving forward? I mean, now that marketing's back and healthy, it's really just going to be to see how this team meshes and who can actually be a part of the core going forward. And Javari Parker's only there right now for two years. Um, Levine obviously is going to be there long-term, but you're really kind of trying to figure out as, as Brendan just mentioned, who's going to be here long term? Um, it's all about now setting a new foundation because when you get rid of a head coach, you're training, you're you're changing the culture. And obviously, this team is still changing the culture. And Jimmy Butler is just you know two years removed. They're still trying to figure out their new identity, and that's that's all you're trying to find the rest of the season is who is the Chicago Bulls team going forward. Yeah, definitely important. And like you guys mentioned, the internal development, seeing what you have with these players. I think the two pieces you have pretty much locked in right now are Wendell Carter and Lori Market. And other than that, you're kind of feeling it out. You know, Zach Levine's been great as well, but you still want him to start picking up on defense. Now, moving on to another also, big story. I want to say too, Nick, yeah. before you move on, uh, Chris Dunn and Bobby Portis are both playing in the G League now too. So they're going to be coming back soon as well. And both guys play defense too. Yes. Very true. Yeah. So that should give them some nice energy. It'll be interesting to see what happens with those guys. If they make any moves, if they look to keep those guys. I know I think Bobby Portis is a free agent at the end of the year. Chris Dunn, his variety out there, you know, he had some good moments, but he's dealt with a lot of injuries. So see what happens with that. Moving on, though, to one of the biggest storylines probably over the last month or two, and that's Markel Fultz. Recently announced by his agents that he's dealing with a nerve issue called TOS. It's, a, you know, a physical injury that actually impacts him shooting the basketball and, you know, the range of motion. What were your thoughts about finding this out about Fultz? Were you kind of relieved that it's not a mental thing and there's actually physical damage there? Um, I, I was relieved because the kid had gone through so much from day one. Um, he had a nice summer league and everything was starting to look up. And, of course, you hear the rumors about, you know, the motorcycle accident or if that's a thing. And you start to hear, you know, stuff throughout his, his entire career so far throughout the first two years is his shoulder. And to hear that it's, it's a 
it's a syndrome up in his shoulder a uh, nerve issue um that's that, that can be fixed over six weeks that that's great that's great to hear and hopefully i don't i don't think he'll play for you know the, the remainder of this season for philly just in, t- in terms of like a mental hurdle this is such a mental hurdle for any player especially a number one pick and you've never we haven't seen this in the nba that i know of especially from a rookie yeah that, that you know rare the, situation. the story the story's developed so and been so blown up that it's tough to come back from i mean tos right that, that's yep. the acronym for it yep yeah uh, i mean i mean reading up on the injury like i i've never heard of anything like this you know abnormal movement um it affects obviously his shot uh maybe the first player in nba history to ever suffer from an injury like this so it's something new i like, i know i've never seen it and obviously it becomes a mental part of it too and now you know, obviously everybody's already saying, is he the biggest bust? I mean, it's so early and we don't know who he is as a player. As um, his agent said, you know, he was the number one pick for a reason. I mean, if you watch his college highlights, this kid, this kid could play. And, oh, yeah. You know, you it's all about the fact, that, yeah. right. It's all about, can he be healthy? And, or, you know, can he get close to being healthy? And then what's that version of Markel Fultz look like? But um, it, it's a terrible thing. You just got to give him time. And to people who are, you know, jumping, jumping the bandwagon and they're already, you know, over the cliff and saying bust and everything else. You, you got to give kids time. Look at Joel Embiid. How long did oh, we yeah. have to wait to see what he became? Yeah, yeah. same thing. Had to wait a year for Ben Simmons too. So uh, obviously, you know, there's some concern with it. Like you guys said, I think it's a relief in terms of, you know, just being a fan and a Sixers fan or anybody who's an NBA fan is that he doesn't have anything that's like he just didn't psych himself out and lost his jump shot. There's actually something physically wrong and that can be fixed and help him get back to that level. You know, we don't know what that level is, but the fact is there's an opportunity for him to get there, I think, is a very positive note for everybody, including him. I'm sure he's very happy about it to have somebody actually diagnose what's wrong. Now, talking Markel Fultz, you know, do you think Philly's going to sit on him and keep him the rest of the season, or they might still look to move him? I, I think Philly sits and waits, and then that's probably the best decision that they can do. They're finally starting to join his side of the fight, which is there's something wrong with my shoulder. I don't need to be taking these repetition jump shots. I need somebody to actually look at my shoulder. Because last season we saw the ugly shots and the, the, the forced shots in practice when media would come into practice. And then you saw it in game, and, and you know how miserable it have, that, that, that has to be for Fultz. Now he's finally getting the help he needs, um, and whatever help that needs is 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 great. And I'm, I'm glad to see Philly um, offering specialists and teams that help offering doctors that aren't, you know, contracted through Philly. They're actually, like, giving permission to go to L.A. And, like, they want the best for Markel after a year and a half now, and, and that that's great. I think they, they sit for now i don't think they pull a trade or anything like that i don't think they would be all in on Fultz's recovery right now if they wanted a trade yeah i think i mean i think you, for a lot of the reasons you just mentioned i mean he's so young you don't give up on him yet and you've and as you kind of mentioned nick ben simmons too joel and they they're top they're pieces of their core they had to wait for it it, yeah. it didn't come easy we had there was a lot of waiting around and and you know, we, we then we got only thirty six games of Embiid, and he got hurt again, and we lost him again. Yeah. Um, so you just give it time, and why give up? And also, from a business standpoint, what's the value on Fultz right now? Uh, uh, realistically, yeah. it, it can't be good. And he's a first overall pick. Why would you want to sell so quickly? Even if maybe maybe you do trade him in the future, but at least let him come back and see what you got. Yeah, I think now knowing that it's a curable thing and they can fix it and he'll have the opportunity to kind of get better and there's not as much pressure because it is an injury, I think he will do a little bit better. And it also has Philly with an opportunity to have almost a super team where, you know, if Fultz lives up to that number one overall hype, he's developing into some all-star type player. Now they have Jimmy Butler, Fultz, Simmons, and Embiid. That team's looking pretty stacked. So I think it would be smart for Philly. And like you said, Corey, they can kind of sit on it too. If maybe he doesn't fit with what they have, they just work up his value. They look to move him next year when he's 100% healthy. Exactly. Talking sure. about uh, point guards, actually, you know, obviously there's a couple teams in the league that really need point guards. In your eyes, what are some of the teams that need them the most? Well, I look at two teams, two teams that are screaming they need point guards, and that that is the Phoenix Suns and the uh, San Antonio Spurs. Uh, the Phoenix Suns first, uh, they have I- Ali Okobo, uh, who they drafted this uh pass off season for and and they need that is their currently their only point guard on the roster in Phoenix and and the rumor came out about them moving on from Trevor Reza on January 15th 
in search of a point guard. And and that's that seems crazy to me because they signed him for so much money, first of all. And then second, uh, they drafted a Kobo. I think they need to go out and get a veteran point guard that currently isn't signed. And I have a guy in mind who's finally healthy, and that's Mario Chalmers, who, who last season I feel like he rushed back and played backup for Memphis. And you could tell he was rushed back because he didn't look like himself. And Mario's not a flashy guy, but he's somebody who could help a guy like Okobo, you know, get through a game. And and Okobo is not going to be a really flashy point guard. But Mario has these ins and outs of the game that make – because he's such a slow point guard. I think Mario would fit there and, and show Okobo, like, how to manage, manage a game and, like, get through a game. And just just a mentor for Okobo right now. And, and it wouldn't be too expensive for Phoenix, who's trying to currently rebuild around DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker, and that would take a lot of the pressure off of Booker, who's currently injured. And now look at a team like the Spurs, who lost to DeJounte Murray on October 8th with a torn MCL, which was very sad to hear because I was very excited to watch his growth in year two. He had uh, high expectations coming into year two. But they, they don't really have another point guard other than Derek White on the roster. And, and you, I guess if you add in Patty Mills, um, of course, Patty Mills is a very good point guard, but, you know, he's he's not, he's very inconsistent in terms of is he going to shoot every time he comes down or is he going to dish it? I mean, right now, both those teams need point guards for wins, and I think that, that that's just what they need right now. And I, I don't think they need to trade for a point guard, both teams. I think there's a few veterans on the, the market right now that could be cheap pickups. So – I have two teams in mind. Um, I have the Spurs as well, and then I have the Pelicans. Um, I'll start with the Spurs trade first. As you mentioned, the John Thing Murray getting hurt was terrible. Um, It it obviously changed the entire complexion of the season. I I had Murray as a defensive player of the year candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm looking at – it's just not a ton of point guards. And the Spurs don't need anybody flashy. Uh, So I I looked at a trade with, like, Orlando, and I thought maybe something like DJ Augustine and, like, Terrence Ross for Pau Gasol. Uh, maybe Orlando goes full rebuild. You throw in a draft pick along with that. Um, and then Augustine's a decent point guard. He's been playing extremely well this season. He can shoot the three. Terrence Ross is a deep, decent three-point shooter because the Spurs just don't have shooters. Um, that's what they lack on this team. Uh, and then, like, when I looked at the Pelicans, I thought about maybe, like, Terry Rozier. I mean, they – obviously, Alfred Payton's out for another, I think, six weeks with an ankle injury, I want to say. Yeah. Um, so maybe they go after Terry Rozier. There's just too many guys in Boston. Maybe you throw your 2019 first-round pick and a pairing of, like, Frank Jackson and Darius Miller or something. Um, I don't – a lot of the teams that are tanking, like the Suns need a, a point guard. But at this point, you already – you only got four wins. Like, of course. Why, why add talent at this point or veterans? Um, and I just don't think there's a lot of young guys on the market. I'll play devil's advocate to the Suns' point, is I think when you're developing a team – I think it benefits you to have a veteran point guard, somebody who can kind of set everybody up, get them in position, kind of tell them how to run the show. And I think it would make life easier for some of the guys like Devin Booker or DeAndre Ayton, who's had struggles at times. I think if you have a you know, a point guard, I think I would look at the Suns definitely as a place. I think Orlando needs a point guard because honestly, realistically, Orlando has a real shot to make the playoffs in the East if that's what they want to do. I'm sure mm-hmm. they would help them if they want to go full rebuild. That's cool too. But I think it would help their organization to kind of get out of the you know the dumps after not being in the playoffs since Dwight Howard was there. Then, like you guys mentioned, like you mentioned, Corey, the Pelicans, since Alfred Payton's hurt, that team's really dropped off. And I think Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday have both mentioned how Drew Holiday plays better at the two. So getting a point guard in there I think would be really beneficial. Like you guys mentioned, uh, the Spurs. I think there's a lot of talent on that team when you have a LaMarcus Aldridge and a Marta Rosen. You don't have a point guard, it hurts. I think I would just mention the Knicks, too, if they're looking for their future point guard because they have three point guards on the team, but talking to a lot of Knicks fans, none of them really believe that any of them will be the long-term starter. So you're looking at the Suns, the Magic, the Pelicans, the Spurs, the Knicks. And I think if you're looking at names that possibly could be on the trade market, I think you look at a guy like Jeremy Lin in Atlanta. You look at a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie who has an expense, expiring contract. Same thing with Terry Rozier, Milos Tocetovic. To- uh, Delon Wright, Thomas Anaransky, Trey Burke, and then even Markel Fultz if you wanted to go for like a young piece. But what would be some other names you guys have in mind? I know you brought up Mario Chalmers. Who else are you guys thinking? Uh, it, I wasn't thinking of anybody else, but I was also thinking about uh, you, you guys were talking about New Orleans. They just signed Andrew Harrison to the two-way contract. And uh, experiencing Andrew's growth, I think that right now with Alfred Payton out down there, I think that that would, that would be a steady backup 
for them, just watching Andrew grow throughout the years in the Grizzly system. Andrew's a very solid guy once he figures out the guys that are around him, that are that he's playing with. Um, yeah, just watching Andrew Harrison grow, it's, that's a very good signing by New Orleans in the two-way department. Anybody yeah. else in mind for you that you think will be out there? Um, point guards on the move? Yeah. Uh, I mean, DJ Augustine, as I mentioned, I think he's one guy, especially with how he's playing right now, the Magic could probably get some kind of draft pick with him, a, you know, a late first or a second rounder. Um, I, I I would say like a dark horse would probably be – no, I, 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 I mean, there's so say many John Wall rumors. About it. There's so many John <laughs> Wall rumors. Is there a real possibility that he gets moved? If someone's willing to take that contract, I mean, I think it's next year. Pops up the I, I, if, I would take him on the in the right circumstance. If you can get a talent like John Wall, you're it's still hard to get that caliber of player on your team. If your team is like, you know, maybe the Knicks. Not saying it'd be a good pairing, but you know, that's a star player, and it's been hard to bring talent into places like that recently. Yeah, I think you know if you feel like you're locked and you have other pieces on your roster already locked up, that's why people have brought up Detroit. Like you already, you know, bought in with Blake and you could re-sign Andre, and then you have your stars. I think John Wall is a big risk because there's a chance you know the injuries come back or he gets worse as it kind of progresses with those knee injuries. But I mean, if you think it's going to help like push your franchise forward, what are some other point guards you think you guys think anything about Kemba Walker? I know I've heard rumors about D'Angelo Russell. What are you guys thinking on those two? I think anybody that gets D'Angelo Russell is going to be winning. I mean, I'm not sure what his contract is right now. Expiring. Expiring He's a contract agent at the end of the year. Yep. Okay, so so if uh, that would be a good, like if you're trying to push playoffs here, like New Orleans, you look at a team like New Orleans, like we were talking about, or or like literally like New Orleans would be perfect for D'Angelo Russell, and and you know it's an expiring contract. You you get consistent production out of a guy who's trying to come back from injury and prove that he is a very good player in this league and you know i, I like d'angelo russell down in new orleans for sure is but he it just comes out it, what was that Corey? is he there's actually rumors about d'angelo i mean there's been mentions there's nothing from the nets the nets are like very uh close to the chest about that stuff but i wouldn't be surprised if teams made offers i know minnesota asked about him when there was a jimmy butler thing there's been talk of maybe Phoenix asking about him because D'Angelo and Devin Booker are literally like best friends. Um, you know, there's been talk about Orlando, just mostly speculation, but not as much. I think uh, there's a lot of talk about the Nets trading one of the guys being Spencer Dinwiddie or D'Angelo Russell since they're both up at the end of the year. Interesting. I I, I didn't I I didn't even thought about D'Angelo Russell's future um, beyond this season. Uh, I mean, I, if, they, if you're the Suns, I would take a risk on them. What would you want, Nick? I, I know this is ch- kind of changing the question. What, who would you want and from, like, a Suns-Nets perspective if there was a deal? Like, would you have interest in, like, a Josh Jackson? Or, like, what What are your thoughts? I think Josh Jackson has doesn't really have very high value at this time. You know, he's really struggled. It'd be, his, right. It'd be first year's in the league. It would ha- I would think, like, you know, Mikel Bridges would have to be in there and, you know, a first-round pick or something. I think D'Angelo has done enough this season to kind of up his value. He's been somewhat sporadic. You know, he's had some really good games where he dropped almost 40, and then he's had other games where he's had, like, 10 points. So I think, you know, if he keeps boosting up his value, there's a chance to get traded. But there's also a chance where the Nets just look like, you know, we want to maybe keep both these guys because they'll keep having trade value the next two years, and we want to make a bigger move. So I don't think there's any lock. If I was, you know, the guys I mentioned, I think the one guy that we didn't talk about enough is probably Jeremy Lin. It makes a ton of sense for him to get moved from Atlanta. They're looking to rebuild. Trey Young could take on more minutes. I'm sure they could bring up some other guys to play point guard. And if Lin, they kind of use that time in the first few months to get healthy, he could definitely be a solid point guard for a lot of teams. I hadn't thought about Jeremy Lin either. And he hasn't, to be honest, he's looked a lot, and he's not 100% yet. He's looked a lot better in my eyes than I expected coming back from a tendon injury. I think you get a solid player in either one. He's he's definitely solid. He he could definitely be a sixth man on another team. Yeah, like a a team like, I mean, even New Orleans, San Antonio, like adding him there, if he's starting and he's not necessarily needs to be your best guy, I think that's not bad. Thomas Sanoranski hasn't had a great year, but, you know, last year we saw what he could do when John Wall was out. Uh, DeLon Wright, I've heard people mention him in Toronto. He doesn't necessarily get a ton of minutes, and he's had some real highlight plays. You know, obviously there's a Terry Rozier talk with Boston, but I don't think anybody really wants to trade with Danny Ainge because they just feel like they've been getting ripped off or they're asking too much for him. And I believe he's on an expiring deal as well. Yes. 
So, and the, but he's a restricted free agent, so it comes with something. Honestly, you know, there's in you know Trey Burke has been someone brought up as well in the Knicks, who are kind of looking more so to develop. Emmanuel Moody is getting minutes. You know, Frank Nelikan has been in and out of the rotation. He's another name that's been out there too. That uh, there's some chance that he could be traded. I I don't know why I wouldn't. I saw that rumor. Why? I and mean, we we haven't seen him a, a lot of recently. He's been out of the rotation, which is weird. Yeah, Fizdale hasn't. Um, he's been going to Moody a lot, and I mean Moody just had a big game against the Bucks, you know, last week, uh, where he had thirty-one points, I think, and sixteen between the fourth and overtime. So I mean, he's been playing extremely well, obviously. But uh, you know, Nidal Akina is supposed to be the guy. You know, he's was it his sophomore year, or this is now yeah, his? Sophomore. Yeah. Um, I, give him reps. What do you? You're not playing for anything. I, I don't understand why he's out of the rotation completely. Yeah, that, definitely that, been weird. That Nilly Kina like situation sounds very sketchy in terms of like like Corey said, like you're not playing for anything. Like show me what you got, kid. Like this could be your last year to show us what you got here, and you're absolutely not playing him at all. Yeah, especially because I think that he's flexible enough with his defense to play it to one or two. I mean, he's a really good defender at a young age. But uh, what do you guys think about, like, Kemba Walker? No way. No yeah, season. I was about to say that. I don't think there's a chance uh, he gets moved. There's no way. Jordan Jordan also has come out and said how much he loves Kemba and wants him to stay. There, there's no way Jordan would ever would ever say yes to a trade this year. It's just not happening. There's no well, way. Not only that, but if you, if you, get, if you do deal Kemba, how are you going to sell tickets? Because, like, who else, who else is on that roster that's going to make you come to the games? I mean, unless you're a diehard – Hornets fan, of course, but that's tough then too because you just you just dealt your your best player for what? I hope draft picks, you know. Yeah, I say there's more of a chance they make a trade to better the roster than there is a chance of them trading Kemba. Yeah. What about somebody like Goran Dragic? If let's say the Heat go in the full tank mode, which looks like it could possibly happen. I would love the the I would love somehow if they went full tank mode. A Gordon, I had this down as one as one of my fake trades. Goran Dragic for like a Pau Gasol and, and somebody else, um, like this, a first round pick. Probably, I think the Spurs have, or Spurs have an extra first round pick from the Kawhi trade. Yeah, um, so I, that that's a move I would make from the San Antonio. It adds some three point shooting, adds them um, a play, uh, some type of playmaking point guard. The Forbes has been solid from shooting from deep, and Patty Mills is okay, but like those just aren't you know thirty minute a night guys. Dragic is. Yeah, Dragic would definitely help out that that Spurs system. And we haven't really seen Dragic play in a system, like an actual system. We've seen him play in Phoenix with some of the leftovers and, like, now down in Miami with, you know, Dwayne Wade and all that. But, like, that's not even a system right now. They're kind of just – so, like, San Antonio would be the perfect team for him because I think he'd be a, a great system point guard. Yeah, it'd definitely be a nice combination with Pop. What about somebody like um, George Hill? who, you know, the Cavs obviously are going to have a tanking season, and he's a veteran point guard. And I believe that the second – he does he's not an expiring contract, but I believe one of part of his contract next year is only partially guaranteed. I, I like George Hill, and I, th- I think he needs to bounce back. I need, he, he needs to bounce back on a team that has full confidence in him because after last season and, and the way this season has developed for the Cavs, I, I just think that – he needs a team, and I'm not sure which team it'll be, but I, I think he needs a team that needs has full confidence because I, I like George Hill a lot. I think he just needs to have that responsibility restored within him and know he can do it again for like teams to get the full George Hill effect because he's a very efficient point guard, and he'll do whatever on either side of the ball. Uh, I mean, I could see Phoenix going after him. Uh, you know, maybe yeah, not a lot of pressure. That'd yeah, be the perfect not a lot situation. of pressure. Um, I mean, they have some tradable co- contracts, and maybe they want to get out from TJ Warren and bring in a veteran point guard like Hill. Uh, you, you know, throw in a guy like Bender who hasn't been that good. Um, something like that possibly could be something that works. Um, I don't know, but George Hill, just, like as you guys mentioned, he just hasn't been good. I mean, yeah. he had a couple games. He was off and on in the playoffs. You know, he had 19 points one night, then he had three points the next night. Um, as Nick knows, I've never been a big George <laughs> Hill fan since the Pacer <laughs> days. Um, he's not a point guard. He's more of a he's more of a two guard um, yeah. who who leans towards a defensive minded two guard. Doesn't really like being aggressive on offense. Can shoot the three point shot well, um, but I, I don't know. The older he gets, he seems to be getting banged up too more and more. Um, I, I, just, I don't know. I'm not a fan. And he still has two years left or one year left after this. 
What are your thoughts on anybody else? Anybody else out there you think will be a possible name? Or do you think any of the bigger, you know, contending teams are going to all of a sudden want to upgrade their point guard position? Yeah, we covered everyone. That's good. I, yeah. I, I, I could see I could see Utah trying. I think Utah wants to change their roster up in some fashion. Um, Ricky Rubio has been, again, a very bad offensive player this year from the point guard position. Just um, featured in uh, Cam's most disappointing vets article. So check that out. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Every it's the start of it. Um, Dante Exum hasn't been, you know, anything overly flat. The team's struggling, so I wouldn't be surprised if they went after a, some kind of six man. I'm, Jeremy Lin actually would probably be a really nice fit there. Um, a guy you mentioned earlier, Nick. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they went after a point guard. Yeah, I don't know if the Nets will trade him, but I think Spencer Dewey would be a nice fit in Utah as well. Ooh, you can't. You got to hold on to that guy. He wore he wore um Stan Lee sneakers that one night, didn't he? Actually? Yeah, he wears different sneakers every night by his own brand, and he donates some money to charity. So Spencer's a great yeah. guy. But anything else on the point guard talk, guys? I, I do like that that uh, Utah idea. I think they are one or two pieces away, and I also think that expectation after last year is like Corey said, going to make them since they're off to such a slow start this year make them want to change up the roster a little bit. And I could definitely see them changing up at the point guard situation, especially with the, the way the way Rubio has been playing. And I like I like Dinwiddie and uh, Lynn like you guys were talking about. That makes and a lot I think, of sense. Uh, favors, too, is probably a very tradable contract because next year is only partially guaranteed and it's such a high number you can kind of use in different deals. So something to think about as well. But uh, that wraps it up. Brendan, great having you on the show for the first time. Tell them where they can find you on Twitter. Uh, at Smart 21 Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you, Corey, for having me on tonight. It was a pleasure, Brandon. Thanks for hopping on the show. And thank Nick, you. as always. Yes, as always, Corey. And you can check out the show, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Google Play, Dash Radio, and YouTube.